Dr. Sarfati studied with Hans Bethe and other leading physicists from the World War II atomic bomb Manhattan Project in the late 1950s and early 1960s at Cornell. MIT physics historian David Kaiser credited Sarfati with the bestseller How the Hippies Saved Physics as a leading promoter of the importance of quantum entanglement as early as the late 1950s, leading to the quantum computer industry. The CIA and U.S. military agents asked Dr. Sarfati to work on physical explanations of our consciousness and how flying saucers work over 50 years ago. He has solved both of these problems by applying battle-tested mainstream physics of Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum mechanics. Dr. Sarfati also significantly influenced President Reagan in formulating the Strategic Defense Initiative, one of Dr. Safari's predictions on the control of gravity for space flight and direct energy weapons is part of a $250 million warp fusion reactor program at Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab. Jack is now working on adding consciousness to artificial intelligence neural networks at the three nanometer scale of Apple Computer's M3 chip, as well as the control of gravity with small amounts of energy for spaceflight, making rocket and jet propulsion obsolete and allowing practical interstellar travel to habitable exoplanets. So that that Jack, that is your new that is your new uh, that's, the, the, that, that's your new <laughs> intro. Uh, I'll just make a brief statement, and then if people want to ask me questions where I don't go crazy, may I add their questions? Um, I've been read into some classified information, military information, and um, I, you know, all I can say is I think I sort of know everything there is to know. There are no more mysteries. Um, and if I were able to share them in full detail, it would blow everybody out of the water, including everybody in Washington. But suffice it to say, seriously, seriously, suffice it to say that I back up David Grush, everything, you know, his core narrative, David Grush. Uh, also, everything Phil Corso said, just about everything Rick Doty has said, even though I know he's controversial. And... Um, uh, but the main thing, it's time travel. These things, these machines, you know, have time travel capability. Um, and they also have weapons, serious weapons. Uh, and um, what else? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so and they, you know, things like mind control, stuff like that. So let me stop there. And then is that, if anybody wants to ask a question, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer the questions if I understand them. Yeah, well, I, I've set things up. People can unmute themselves. We got a couple of hands raised. Uh, let me go to Daniel Davis first. I think he had his hand up first. Daniel, go for it, sir. Hi, I'm. You guys are Max working good. Um, so you mentioned the time travel thing. Yes. Um, I reverse. I assume you mean uh, reverse time travel. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so that's. I'm very sympathetic with that. Um. What I'm curious about is uh, what your proposed resolution to the uh, paradox problems are. Uh, many worlds, something along those lines. Yeah. Well, you know, there are lots of people. There are plenty of papers on this. And actually, there's one thing I agree with Eric Davis. Eric Davis and I have our differences, but we agree about this. There are no time travel paradoxes. There are two. There are actually two explanations of them, and they're kind of equivalent. Uh, one is the. Uh, the Igor Novikov. Igor Novikov was, I don't know if he's still alive, but he yep. was a Moscow, physicist in Moscow, works with the, worked with Kip Thorne. And if you look on Wikipedia, there is the Novikov Global Consistency yep. Conjecture. Okay. So the idea is if you try to go back in time, it's an old idea in science fiction, but it actually works in physics. They've done the, the uh, universe is one big loop. If you try, if you try to create a paradox, you'll fail. What they've done, what Kip Thorne and people at Caltech have done, they've taken little models like billiard balls going through a wormhole that's like a time machine, and they try to create a paradox. And what happens is, it's just quantum mechanics, and what happens is the quantum probability amplitude with Feynman, you know, the probability that anything will happen is zero when you try to make a paradox. So it's, it's you know, it's in this simple little little problems that you can calculate 
the what, what Igor Novikov says about preventing a paradox actually works. And there is the alternative that you mentioned that if you try to make a paradox, the universe splits. I don't sort of like that, but but uh, but it's a possibility. And the guy who actually proposed that, by the way, there is a paper by David Deutsch, who's a smart guy from Oxford University in England. And he's like the inventor, one of the inventors of the quantum computer. And he actually has, I think in physical review around 1986, there's a paper on uh, uh, qu uh, quantum mechanical time travel, and he goes through, um, uh, you know, the the splitting universe, man in the high castle sort of thing, in the, a way that's consistent, that's consistent with the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory. So that is an alternative, but it turns out that the two pictures, those two pictures, are actually equivalent, because if you're American. in any, because if you're in any one particular timeline if you, you see you're only if you're trapped in one timeline everything's going to look consistent to you okay so and and part of that is that if 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 you if you do go back in time and you do have an uh, interact with stuff in the past then it's all a self-consistent loop everything that happened since that time is consistent with going back in time so so that's it okay another question um have so, so are you familiar with the um the work of Dr. Barak Shoshani? Uh, very, to remind me, I don't. Uh, maybe. Uh, okay, so I, I believe he's out of Brock University. Anyway, he's done um he's done a series of papers recently over the past few years um that are inspired by the papers you're talking about, where he explores oh. uh both the many worlds and the the Novikov self consistency conjecture in uh, more detail. And uh, just to kind of give the cliff notes of, uh, of what he put together, basically he kind of, uh, I can flag out a picture somewhere. Okay. Yeah, so he kind of he kind of shoes hold together the um, the the two where he's saying that it's a uh, an n dimensional torus of uh, Novikov loops that are making up a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space. That becomes a, a, a traversable multiverse, basically. And he's got about five or four or five different papers out right now. Um, Do me a favor. Will you send those links to Tim, and Tim will send it to me? Where yeah, yeah, sure, sure thing, sure thing. Is it Oh Giorgiani? Did you say Giorgiani? What's his name? Is he a uh, Iranian? Uh, Shoshani. Shoshani. Is he from Iran? Uh, I'm not sure where he's originally from, but currently he's in Canada. Oh, he's in Canada. Is he at the Perimeter Perimeter Institute? Where, where's he at? Uh, I think Brock University. Uh, let me... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yes. and it, actually, D Daniel, if I could jump in, I'm going to drop Jack's email into uh, chat, and that way it's yeah. not just broadcast yeah. public on the internet. No, that's so... fine. That's fine. I don't care. That's all. I got so many emails, and you know, I can always block people. Do, do you just want me to link you to his archive paper? Yeah, just send all the, whatever you have. Oh, I, okay. Look at it. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Dr. Sarfati, it's a pleasure. Um, I had a question for you uh, regarding um, the SDI era stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm really interested in the reverse engineering efforts that were occurring just prior to that and during that time. Um, and so far, I found uh, it looks like Schwinger and Friedrich Winterberg were kind of tertiarily related to that. I was wondering if you had any other names of scientists that I might okay, look well, up. I don't know, they're, they're, well, of course, tell it. Okay, all I can. Okay, my role in it was actually written down. If you, uh, this guy Kim Barafato was a witness to it. He was, and he wrote a chapter in my uh, 2002 book, Destiny Matrix. There is actually a free copy of that up on academia edu if you go to if you join academia edu you can download uh just look for destiny matrix um or you just send me an email and i, I can get, i could send you the link uh what basically happened was okay let me see if i can say this in a few words um i was uh there was i was uh basically a, a f informal science advisor for a think tank called the Institute for Contemporary Studies, which in San Francisco in North Beach, uh, it was set up by Cap Weinberger, who became Secretary of Defense, uh, Milton Friedman, the economist, Brent Scowcroft, who was a uh, national security, um, and uh, Ed Meese, Ed Meese, 
all these guys around when they set this thing up uh, in San Francisco in the late seventies when Reagan was the governor of California. And it was like the main think tank. It was connected with the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, and, you know, Teller, Teller was a member of that. And uh, any case, uh, I won't go into all the details how this happened, but I was like the, the science guy, informal. Very, you know, they would pay me some money, but it was mainly in cafe society. If you read how the, oh, if you read how the hippies say physics by David Kaiser, he talks about it and he interviews Laurie Chickering, who was the head of that institute. Uh, and in any case, what happened was, <laughs> it was a fun, it's a, actually a funny story. It's a hilarious story. What happened was um, I was uh, one of one of the, one of my mentors was a, a billionaire, this billionaire guy named Marshall Nafee, who uh, who uh, uh, ran uh, United Artists Theaters. He started. He was part of one of the the the, uh, uh, the original financiers of uh, Comcast, Comcast Corporation, and uh, any case, and he was like a. You know, if Francis Ford Coppola wanted to make a movie, he would come to Marshall and talk about financing, stuff like this. See, the, he and his brother, Robert Navy, they were, this is back like in the 70s, they're already billionaires, right? And uh, United Artists Theaters, in any case, there's long history, this family has long history in the movie business in Hollywood. Reagan used to work for Marshall's father. When Reagan made all those movies in the 30s and the 40s, his boss was Marshall Napier's dad. So Reagan and and uh, Marshall, they were basically, you know, buddies. They okay. Any case, uh, uh, Laurie asked to, wanted to have a lunch with Marshall. Wanted to talk to Marshall about something, and so and I arranged it. And it is 1980, 1980, 1981 maybe, and we're sitting around. Uh, Enrico Banducci's. Enrico Banducci, uh, that was a, a famous cafe in North Beach where everybody used to go. It was like the Cafe de la Paix in Paris. Well, when all the Hollywood people would come, they would go, go there. Or they would go to a place called Tosca's. So it's just a couple of like in places, you know, especially back then. Any case, uh, Marshall had just made a move. Oh yeah, Marshall was a silent partner with Al Broccoli on all the, the, uh, the uh, James Bond movies. Like we actually, Marshall actually had one of the one of the Aston Martins from the from the original Sean Connery James Bond. They had four of them, and Marshall actually had one in his garage. You know, so um, but so the Marshall, scientists, the scientists, well, yeah. So, but in any case, uh, Mar Marshall had just made a movie. This is important. He had just made a movie called Meteor with uh, Sean Connery, and the plot of that movie is a meteor is going to come and wipe out the Earth. And uh, what happens, uh, so this, remember this Cold War going on, you know, Soviet Union, 1980. And so what happens in the movie that the Russians and the Americans get together. In any case, so we're sitting around and Marshall didn't tell, Laurie didn't realize Marshall was talking about a science fiction movie, but Marshall said, hey, look, what if extraterrestrials were to attack us? And then we'd all have to get together. We'd have to get together with Russia. And then Marshall started talking about, well, we could have these lasers shooting down the missiles and stuff like that. You know, he went through this whole kind of thing. And uh, so after that was over, Laurie asked me, Jack, can you can you uh, write up what Marshall was talking about in a short little you know memo? And so I wrote it up, but I was also working on stuff like that. Uh, you know, and I had been talking to Marshall. I mean, we were, he was like, you know, we would hang out together all the time in the cafes and and stuff like that. So in any case, I wrote this thing up and in, in the uh, in the memo I talked about, and with these beams, we could also render nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. I actually wrote those those words. In any case, I gave the thing to Laurie Chickering. A couple of weeks go by, I'm walking into the Cafe Trieste, and <laughs> Laurie walks up and he says, hey, Jack, you know that memo you gave me? I gave it to Paul Nietzsche. And he really liked it. Paul Nietzsche was like the you know, main security guy for Reagan. Uh, so, um, and then, uh, and then also, also I was, Cap Weinberg, who was then the Secretary of Defense, his son, Cap Jr., was one of my fans. So all the crazy stuff I was doing, all this stuff, I would also give it to Cap Jr. 
Cap Jr. would give it to his father. And then at one point, uh, Cap Jr. said they were on a helicopter going to Camp David and they were reading my stuff. You know, his father and Reagan, they were looking at the stuff that I was sending. <laughs> All right. Then, uh, so then, if you look at Edward Teller's biography what, called Dark Matters, he says he was surprised. He was surprised that Reagan actually did. So the reason I think that, you know, the reason I think it happened was because when Reagan saw Marshall Navy kind of endorsing the stuff that Ed Teller was trying to get him to do, that may have, you know, he didn't, apparently I was told that Reagan didn't quite trust Teller Maybe he was a little dead. Maybe there was, who knows? But when he saw his, you know, his buddy, the, the guy, you know, his, one of his friends. Uh, any case, so, so that's the story of uh, uh, of how uh, how we defeated the Soviet Union. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Do you have a, uh, does that answer the question? More or less, yeah. Thank you. Awesome, okay. Jared. Thank you. Let Let me go to Mikhail. And Mikhail, is it okay if I ask you to turn your camera on, sir? Uh, hi, Tim. Sorry, my actually, my camera is not working, but if you don't mind, if I can ask the question. Is that yeah, okay? go for it. All right. Uh, Dr. Sarfati, it's an honor to yeah. speak to you. I just wanted to ask you one question is, if you look at the UAP uh, and the Tic Tac that, you know, the conversation that uh, Commander David Fravor had, we yeah. recently had an event in India where two Rafales fighter aircrafts uh, uh, chased a Tic Tac type UFO in Impala. Uh, not in India, actually. I wanted to ask you this question is, the government is looking at uh, this in a very serious matter in India. How do you think we should go about understanding the UAP phenomenon in India and other places? Because the Air Force is looking at it in a very serious manner. The Navy is also. And I also wanted to ask you, have you heard about uh, Victor Schauberger? Uh, there's yeah. Been a lot of... Yeah, yeah, forget the show, buddy. Yeah, no, that's that's okay. We we, right. we 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 understand the whole point is that we understand this perfectly now. We understand it. That doesn't mean we know how to reverse engineer it, but we understand it. It's it's warp drive, it's control of the gravity field with small amounts of energy. The trick is to do it with small amounts of energy. And um, the the there's a, a very simple way of them to tell if it's a a warp drive that's because the the frequency shifts will be anomalous in other words if they have any kind of like uh, uh detect if the FLIR radar whatever they have there uh if it's able to do spectral analysis of the sync of the, the radiations coming from the object they're going to find for example uh if a tic tac is coming toward you on a collision course heading toward you you're going to see a, a red shift you should see a, a blue shift, you know, like if it, if it, if it, if a, a train, a fast train is coming toward you, the whistle will sound higher in pitch as the train is coming toward you. That's the Doppler blue shift. Okay. And it'll, it'll sound uh, lower frequency as it's moving away from you. Well, in warp drive, because the gravitational field acts opposite to the, uh, if there were any motion of the object relative to the atmosphere, uh, so you're going to see, and so you're going to see what looks like a reverse Doppler effect. That's the prediction, uh, and um, uh, so that's very easy to see. And so, you know, if they see the ship coming in a collision course, you're going to see a red shift, and if uh, and if it's going away from you, you're going to see a blue shift, and that's exactly uh, consistent with the Alcubierre. If you look at the Alcubierre warp drive pictures. When, when the space in front of the ship at the nose is being compressed, that's attractive gravity and that's a redshift. And when uh, the space behind at the tail is being expanded, uh, that's anti-gravity and, uh, and that's the blue ship. Now, that also explains why Travis Taylor got sick at Skinwalker Ranch. Travis Taylor and other people, they got sick. They got sort of like radiation sickness because they think there is a uh, they they think there's a, a cloaked object about a thousand feet at least you know, a thousand meters in a certain spot above the skinwalk. There might be a, a portal. They think it could be a uh, you know where, where the bigfoot comes out all that kind of stuff. But in any case, never stand underneath 
a hovering flying saucer is my advice to you because in order for it to hover it has to cancel the earth's gravity field right and to cancel it that's anti-gravity and that creates a blue shift which means that uh, uh all the uh the the molecules in the air beneath the bottom of the ship are going to be getting more energy and so that creates ionizing radiation it's you know it's like getting radiation sickness radiation burns they're getting too much x-ray stuff like that so that explains why they got sick that also explains why uh the cia guy kit green you know the doctor uh gave gary nolan you know over at stanford uh, about, about the uh, the blood test uh, data on about a hundred u.s military and uh intelligence people who have been sick or even died apparently i don't know the full details uh from because they've come too close in contact with uh, these uh, objects with these ufos or these whatever they are uh, and so uh, a lot of people have gotten sick. It's sort of like Havana syndrome, some of the symptoms, but it's simply that, okay, so how do you know if these things have warp drive, which means control of gravity and small amounts of energy? You know if uh, you see the blue shift, that's anti-gravity, so those are blue shift, gravitation, anti-gravity blue shift. And if, uh, if you get sick getting too close to it, when you're in the region where there's anti-gravity, you're going to get sick. So it's dangerous. It has medically harmful effects. And that's exactly what they're seeing. There's no mystery to this. It's elementary physics. Well, I, elementary what, physics. Is, is it okay? I just want to ask you one thing, uh, yeah. Mrs. Rufardi, Dr. Rufardi. Uh How do I go? I just wanted to ask you. So I'm interacting with a lot of fighter pilots uh, across the Air Force right now. And the I'm one thing I wanted... I, I'm interacting with a lot of fighter pilots. Yeah, you're, are, so wait, uh, wait, I, I'm not hardly, you're saying you're in contact with them? Is that what you said? No, no, I'm interacting with a lot of fighter pilots who are flying, okay? So I wanted to ask you, what is something that the, as a pilot, I need to be aware of in order to capture them either with FLIR targeting pod or uh, radar capture? I understand blue. What do you mean uh, capture? The, you, can, you can't capture them. No, no, I meant to say, how do I capture them on a video? I, I, I think he's, he's talking about maybe a target lock for the camera. Yeah. Is that what you're... Yeah. Oh, yeah. you mean, oh, you mean to, make, to take photographs? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not that kind of... You have to ask... Well, you should, you know, for that, you should, ask, you should ask Abby Loeb here. People like that, they know that stuff. Or uh, Larry Lempia. But uh, there was something I wanted to say about it. Okay, well, my, I just had a... Uh, Jack, if, if if I could jump in really quick also, yeah. and I think this is something we've talked about. I, I would love your thoughts on this. But um, again, this goes back to Thor and the UAP theory, where he had claimed that reports of shape shifting uh, yeah, right. may have actually been gravitational lensing. And so now, so wait that, a minute, wait a minute. I said it way before him. I was saying okay. years before him. <laughs> that's one. Of, that's an obvious thing. That's obvious because when you're controlling the gravity field. Actually, the gravity field that you're controlling is inside the metamaterial thin shell fuselage. Some of it may leak out. Yeah, of course, this is what's called the Cauchy problem, and some of it will leak out into the into the atmosphere. But it decays very quickly, which is why there are not big heat signatures to it. You know, it's pretty stealthy. It can even uh, make it invisible. So um, yeah, so yeah, of course it's going to shape shift because all the light or electromagnetic uh, signals coming from the thing are going through a gravity field, which is also changing very rapidly in time. Oh, by the way, when you change a gravity field rapidly in time, you also create particles. So you get plasma effects too from that. So uh, yeah, so the shape shift is obvious. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned. There's several things. You have a shape shift. Remember, I had all this 10 years ago, 12 years ago at... Uh, uh, the DARPA conference, the 100 Year Starship Conference, which General Pete Warden, then head of NASA, who had been head of the Space, Space Command, he paid my way there to give the talk. And I mentioned all this kind of stuff basically back then. You know, it's, 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 it's pretty... Um, so so you, have, uh, you have the shape shifting from gravity lensing. You have the um, anomalous frequency shifts that, you know, it should be the opposite to the Doppler shift. And the other thing is that if you get too close to... On, on the anti-gravity part, you're going to get sick and get radiation sickness. Okay, so those are three things. All right. Now, oh, let me say something else. 
You can't fight these things. They have weapons. Okay. They have both offensive weapons and they have defensive weapons. If you try to if you try to shoot, well, 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 of course, wait, let me let me qualify that. It's a big universe, right? It's a big universe. There are many different forms of extraterrestrials out there. Okay, many different life forms uh, from many different places in the universe and at many different times in the universe. But the physics, the physics of how to time travel and how to do all this stuff is very elementary. It's not hard, not hard for you know, not hard for a guy who studied with Hans Bethe. You know, it's you know for engine. It's easy physics. It's basically Einstein's general theory of relativity with some modifications, some quantum theory. The basic ideas of it are very, very simple. That means any civilization anywhere, when they reach a certain level of uh, technology, they're going to discover this. So we have, you know, there. I know. I know this sounds like crazy. It sounds like I know for sure from classified stuff I've been shown. Okay, there I know of, there were three. I know of three different kinds of aliens that are here. Three different kinds. Okay, and I'm sure there are many more. I mean, you know, other people say more. I don't doubt that. I, I used to be very skeptical about all this stuff. I used to you know, <laughs> not believe it, but I've been shown things myself now that that I know. Now, now I'm very confident. I'm an arrogant son of a bitch about this. I'll debate anybody on it. And, you know, if anybody, Mick West, any of these so-called skeptics, they want to come. And, but I know for sure now, before, up until a few months ago, you know, I thought, ah, maybe, maybe, maybe it's all fake, maybe. But now I've been shown vetted stuff. You know, it's real. Okay. And so, and so it's a totally different universe. Okay. So, uh, uh, Tim, did I answer your question? Or I... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I, I appreciate your elaborating on it just for people. Um, on like the low energy warp drive and stuff, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, and this might answer some of the other people's questions about the about the <laughs> low energy. So just to again, just bear with me, with me on the preamble for a second. When, when speaking in general relativity terms, you you know with the with the Einstein metric, you have the g mu nu equals eight pi g divided by c to the fourth. Yeah. That's your your space time metric and your stress energy tensor. Let's just dumb this down to special relativity for e ease sake. Normally, in special relativity's sake, you have a budget. C stays constant, and then you you divide that between your your velocity in space and your velocity in time. So my my question to you, Mr. Sarthati. Is what you're doing to get the low energies? Are you turning C into a variable to change the S and T side? Roughly speaking, the answer is yes. Okay, but it's not C itself that changes. C stays the same. It's what's called, if you want, you know, it's like index of re again. It's like the index of refraction is changing. The C itself doesn't change, but the index of refraction changes because it's okay. inside of the material. And then again, it's not quite the index of refraction because the index of refraction is only for light waves. You have to know the difference between a near field and a far field. The warp drive is a near field thing. So it's, a, it's not the index, it's something, it's, it's, a, it's something called the, the susceptibility. It's the, re okay, physically what it is. So are you like changing material, the permeativity of space time? What? Are you like changing space time's permeativity? Yeah, it, no, I, that's I, no, no, I, I'm Jack. Not doing that. That's sorry, I, I think no. I think that the difference is that the metamaterials part. I think that's the part that. Okay. that, that Let me explain. That I was about to this. explain it, but you guys, you know, keep interrupting me. I was about to explain it. Okay, let me first explain what is the speed of light. What do you know? What light is? First, we have what is light and vacuum. What is it? What is it physically? The the what? speed of information. No, okay, uh, uh, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, you, you just keep going. <laughs> I'll tell you when you can talk, okay? I'm now, right. I'm now giving the Sarfati lecture, okay, on, on light. What's the nature of light? Listen, when I, first of all, Einstein is working on general relativity in 1915, okay? There was no quantum mechanics then. Oh, there was classical, there was classical electromagnetism electromagnetism and there was the beginning of quantum mechanics you know there was the photoelectric effect which einstein did himself there was the Bohr theory of the atom but they didn't really have um, a good understanding when einstein wrote his equation c was just a parameter 
I mean, C, what was C? C was stuff that the, uh, that the optical physicists measured, the speed of light and vacuum. You know, there was all kinds of optical measurements you know, already like 100 years ago, maybe 200 years. When did the first measure the speed of light? I forget. I think in the 18th, 18th century, I think it was, was measured. So, but, and so he knew it was a parameter, okay? And then, so he has his equation. He has the equation after 10 years of struggle. He has the equation. And he has to make sure his equation corresponds to New Newtonian, Newton's, what's called the Poisson equation, field equation. And in order to get his tensor equation to, in the right, in the weak field limit, and in, uh, when things are moving slowly, in the non-relativistic limit, uh, he just it fit it to Newton's thing. And he finds that in order for him to agree with Newtonian gravity and all the measurements that are that are known. Then he, if he puts in the speed of light and vacuum uh, with the Newton's gravity constant, it's g over c to the fourth power, right? When he puts that in, he gets the right answers. Things agree with experiment, so it's kind of empirical. You understand? It was just like black box engineering. So it's, it's empirical. He's fitting he's fitting curves, fitting data, okay, and it's a consistent picture. So it was not very profound what he did there. I mean, the, the equation is profound, but, but get, uh, getting the right coefficient, the, the number, putting in the numbers from coefficient was partly just to get agreement with, with observation, which is, you know, that's, that's good science. That's what scientists do. All right. Years go by, and now we have what's called quantum electrodynamics. You know, Richard Feynman, Schwinger, Tominago, all these guys. Okay. Now we understand what the speed of light is in terms of qu quantum electrodynamics. Basically, you know, roughly speaking to the first approximation, what is, what, why is the speed of light 186,000 miles a second? Why is it that? Why isn't it, you know, 10 miles a second? Okay, well, there's a, now a mechanism is understood. You have to look at the quantum vacuum. The quantum vacuum is a plasma, it's the first approximation of yeah, I'm giving the, the, the most important part of it. There are other parts too. The, it's an electron positron plasma, virtual, I call it virtual electron positron plasma. Okay. And what happens is a real photon scatters off these electron positron pairs. And that interaction, it's, it's the vacuum itself has an index of refraction. A photon gets absorbed by an electron positron pair, and then a short time later, it gets re emitted. And when you do the calculation, there's some French guys really, they actually did a calculation. You can, using uh, uh, parameters of, uh, well, you get a self consistent picture that the point is that the speed of light, okay, this is what's about. the actual number for the speed of light, as say 300 million meters per second, is simply an emergent contingent dynamical quantity depending on the uh, the structure of the density of that um, a virtual electron positron plasma it's a dynamical effect it's, you know it's it's, it's 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 like plasma physics but inside the vacuum it's quantum mechanical plasma physics inside the vacuum okay now you take that same approach and instead of now the photon is going through material and the material has real electric charges and you know has both negative positive charges like ions in a crystal lattice it's electrically neutral it has you know the free electrons the bound electrons and the ionic lattice stuff like that and you do the same calculations you do the same kind of calculations you calculate what's called the index of refraction there's a whole you know cottage industry and physicists who, who did this and uh and then, so you see that the light slows down. So the point is this, the mechanism for the scattering of light in materials with real charges is essentially not very different from the mechanism for the propagation of light in the vacuum from virtual charges. So now the thing is this, so when Einstein writes his, his field equation and he uses the speed of light in vacuum, why should the speed of light in vacuum work inside the matter? Why should it be the speed of light inside the matter that works? Okay, from, from the microscopic, from the quantum mechanical point of view, 
you have it shouldn't be the speed of light and vacuum at all. Also, also, all the tests, all the experimental tests of relativity are not done inside matter. They're done in vacuum, where where g over c the fourth is not directly measured. So all the classic, you know, with the gravitational bending of light, those are all vac basically you know the space tests done in vacuum. And even even the all the tests, even even the replica pound experiment. If you if you read the review articles on the experimental test of relativity, there's no direct testing of Einstein's field equation for inside matter. Not really, and especially when the matter has what's called dispersion, which which better materials have. Especially when the speed of light. Uh, there's another thing. Suppose it's dispersion. Suppose the speed of light depends on the frequency of the light in a given frame of reference. So what do you use in Einstein's equation? What C do you put in the denominator? What do you do? Okay. So there's that. So the point is that the conceptual foundation for people's belief in that particular coefficient inside matter is founded on nothing. It's shaky ground. It's all bullshit. It's not, it, there's been no direct experiments. Okay. And now what, what we do have experiment, the experiment we have, we have the observations of the Tic Tacs. So the Tic Tacs are showing us the warp, that warp drive is real. And the only way warp drive can be real is for this effective speed of light in the denominator, the coupling to go to get very small in effect. I've oversimplified because it's not, it's not, it's not the, the light waves, it's the near field, it's like the Coulomb field. So what you have is if you do basic physics, uh, you have what's called electric, electromagnetic susceptibility functions. They are, if you send an electromagnetic field into material, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a, a wave, it could be like a, a, it could be a static field, it could be like a voltage from a battery. That's an induction field, not a radiation field, an induction field, like, like in the Tesla battery, those are induction fields, they're not radiation, okay? Uh, and so if, if you, if you just take an electrostatic field, take an electrostatic field and put it on inside the metamaterial, the, the electric field, the electrostatic field is going to uh, distort. It's going to separate the positive from the negative charges. That's called polarization, dielectric polarization. Okay. And um, what you're talking about, the static electromagnetic field, the near field, was going to generate the Einstein's equation, a static Gravitational field, it's not going to be a gravitational wave. I'm not talking about waves anymore. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The the Earth's gravitational field is a static field or quasi static. It doesn't it's, it doesn't change very much. It changes very slowly, right? It's a near field. Okay. The mathematics of the near field is different from the mathematics of the far field. They're related. The near field at a certain limit becomes a far field. You know, technically, you have to go. So what's called the Feynman propagator, and you look at the Feynman propagator in the complex energy plane, and the propagator has poles in the sense of complex variable theory. And when you approach the pole, a virtual photon becomes a real photon. Okay. This is all, you, know, you have to read Richard Feynman, you have to understand Feynman diagrams, all that kind of stuff. But physicists under, this is the way physicists think. Okay, So we understand this, but we have a technical language, just like doctors have a technical language. You have to speak the language. Yep. Okay. All right. So, so the point is basically all this is, is very simple, and um, it leads to the point is that that uh, Einstein's general relativity inside matter has not is not uh, a well developed field yet, and that's what's and and the technology the reverse engineering. Okay, the reverse. Here, let me summarize the reverse engineering of these UFOs is simply an applied physics problem of, of, of modifying Einstein's field equations inside the metamaterial condensed matter physics. So it involves a combination of uh, the quantum mechanics and metamaterials and something called unequilibrium thermodynamics and relativity and how to do that to put it together. We basically sort of know how to do it, but you know, that's the, it's, it's just an applied physics problem now. There's, there's so no, there's no this, fundamental uh, mystery. Okay. If we're if we're doing this applied physics thing with with, uh, with Einstein's equation, what? if we're doing this 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 breakdown of Einstein's, so I like that we're playing with the scalar constant here. Your your um your your big G divided by c to the fourth. So is so does Einstein's stay 
do do the equations stay consistent if we apply a dimensional analysis to them and then we take the the yeah. g divided by c to the fourth if we flip yeah. that over and make it a c to the fourth divided by g and stick it over on the g mu's yeah, 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 sure. yeah, 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 yes yes okay sure. okay so the, okay that speaks to price work okay okay interesting okay let me okay let, but since you seem to know a little you know what we do we have to take the we have to work in fourier transform space okay we, we do have to do the fourier trans now it, now in a strong gravitational field with space times curve that becomes a problem because in order to do Fourier transforms, you really uh, can't have too much gravity. It has to be pretty much flat because you know you take a Fourier transform, you integrate over all space and over all time to get sharp frequencies, which I guess. But in curved space time, you have to use you have to use what are called wavelet wavelet scale dependent a, a more general concept than the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is just the first approximation. There's a guy in Moscow. There's a guy in Moscow called Mikhail. Mikhail Altaisky, Altaisky, and he has now updated all of this general relativity quantum field theory using these generalized wavelet scale dependent transforms, which is much which we can apply for strong gravitational field problems. So, uh, so that is a technical problem. So the point is, what you want to do, roughly speaking, you take the Fourier transform of Einstein's space-time equation. Well, what you really want to do is do what's called like a fast Fourier transform. We have a phase space. We have both position and and wave length, and also time and frequency. You know, subject to the uncertainty principle. You know, something. Like so you want to do like fast Fourier transform analysis. So you kind of know where you are and what frequencies you you're interested in. Okay, and uh, so but what you want to do is you only only want to compute the gravity field at uh, long wavelengths and low frequencies, okay? And that will depend upon the metamaterial response function or susceptibility also at long wavelengths and low frequencies. And that you have to apply a voltage, you just apply a voltage, you know, slowly varying voltage, that sort of thing. It's, it's like circuit theory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like LCR, uh, circuits, stuff like that. Yeah, you know, and maybe you have jokes, you know. So you can it's basically electrical engineering. It's like power systems electrical engineering, the actual description of the device. So what so what you have is a your metamaterial, your the fuselage itself, think of the fuselage, it's a bunch of little what are called artificial atoms arranged in a lattice, right? Each little artificial atom can be viewed as a tiny little circuit. So it's, it's like a tiny um Think of it actually what it's going to be. You can model it. And people have actually been doing this. You can model each meta atom as a uh, anharmonic dissipative forced oscillator circuit. Do you see here? Do you get that? Anharmonic. It's nonlinear. So it's going to be a nonlinear oscillator. So it's going to be a curve. With, yeah, yeah. With with, uh, with some resistance, dissipation, a little dissipation. And... Um, and an inductance and a capacitance. You know, you have a capacitance, an induct a magnetic inductance, uh, a resistance, and some nonlinearity, and uh, and a driving and a voltage, a driving force. That's each. That's each meta atom. Each node in the lattice is that. But then they're coupled together. So if you're like a network, it's coupled oscillators. It's like that. You know, it's it's like it's like the the electric grid with all these power stations, okay? But on a micro scale, on a nano scale, even. So that's what the, that's what the meta surface is. It gets complicated. So you know, but but that's basically it. That's basically what the physics is. And see, and you, then, you talk about working yeah. in, you talk about okay. working in curved space time instead of flat space time. So should I be more focused on de Sitter space or anti de Sitter space? No, no, forget that. That's irrelevant. No, okay. no, you see, no, no, you, you, you made a mistake there because first, the center space, man, that's cosmology. That's on a scale where a galaxy is a point. I'm talking about nanometers. Oh, so I, I, I just meant when I'm playing with the, when I'm playing with the equations, like what should I be more focused on, de or anti de or just keep playing? No, 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 no. What you want, no, what you want to do is actually read my stuff. Just, just, just start reading just, my just stuff. To keep going on your stuff. stuff. Okay, I'll keep reading. I just want on Twitter. I, just, I, I put everything, everything on my Twitter feed. And uh, yeah, I post the links and stuff like that. But the thing is this, uh, what do I want to say about it? Okay, the place if you want to start, you have to read Feynman's lectures on gravitation. Okay. Caltech, 1962, I think. It's still the best place to go. 
And I'm, what I'm doing, I'm just applying Feynman diagram technique to this problem. Okay, because it's clear you can, you can so he can do dispersion, he can do everything. In Feynman, gravity is simply what's called a spin to tensor field. He does it against, you know, he starts off with there's no gravity. He starts with just special relativity. There's no gravity, what's called globally flat space time. You have a small perturbation, it's a spin to tensor field. And then when you add a bunch of these things up in an infinite series, you get Einstein's general relativity. So he gets he gets to the, the you know, look at this. but but the point is a lot of the flight of these UFOs in the atmosphere, the stuff that the Navy is seeing, it's weak gravity theory. So Feynman's approach, Feynman's perturbation theory, I think should work pretty well to describe the actual physics problem that we have, you know, uh, trying to explain to Commander Fravor and Ryan Graves how these things work. I can do it, I think, in terms of Feynman diagrams at low, very low water top, you know, fairly simple calculations. So that's what I'm working on now. But the point is, there's no mystery to any of this. It has nothing to do with, with Salvador Paez. It has nothing to do with element 115. What else? Also, all the other has nothing to do. Well, well, the zero point energy may play a role, but that's not that important. It has nothing to do with levitation. It does have to do with superconductors, but they're special kind. They're room temperature superconductors called Froehlich condensates. But that's a, another thing. So the point is, we have, you know, we have many of the key pieces of the puzzle. We have the main pieces of the puzzle, and there are a few, just a few small pieces that, yeah. We're now at the mop up phase. We understand the basic problem. So Jack, we're talking negative susceptance, negative susceptibility. Um, bismuth is 10 to the minus five. Uh, superconductors theoretical limit is negative a third, but split ring resonators are orders of magnitude better than superconductors. Um, oh, really? Since, okay, so what, yep, okay. And, Go and, slow, and, wait, slow down, slow down. That's interesting, slow down, slow down. Are you saying that the, the magnetic permeability, uh, relative permeability of bismuth is 10 to the minus five? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's it's very very small. It's weird that that was found in some. In okay, wait, wait, hang, just uh, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. So if it's ten to the minus five, according to let me just stop. According to Keith Wanzer, that would amplify the S would be uh, ten to the ten. So it'd be you know be t ten billion times stronger. In other words, instead of instead of ten, instead of a uh, ten to the minus forty three reciprocal newtons. It'll be ten to the minus thirty-three, but you you gain you gain a, you gain you amplify by, by by ten billion with that permeability according to his equation. Yeah, you know, if he's right about that, well, he may. Yeah, I don't know if he's right because for some strange reason he never published how he got that. See, let, let me explain something. Let me give a little history about that. About twelve years ago, I gave a talk at a DARPA NASA uh, meeting in which I. Put, which I, I was the first one to say flying so UFOs are warp drive vehicles using metamaterials as the fuselage. Okay. And, um, but in there, I had like the S field. In there, I had, because uh, I was making an algebra with index of refraction, there I had that the S field, the amplification should be the square of the relative electric permittivity multiplied by the square of the relative magnetic permeability, okay? So, that, but then, I won't go through all the details. Then we did, we, we, you know, we were looking at some other paper, there's some some guys in Venezuela, Medina, Stephanie, and we had to make everything relativistically invariant, covariant, you know, symmetry. And then, so then uh, uh, it was fairly complicated. And Keith Wands, who's a professor at Fullerton, along with uh, Jim Woodward, you know, they're in the same faculty there, uh, uh, he said that he got this term one over one over the reciprocal. In other words, it was e squared. It, it was it was the square of the dielectric permittivity plus one over the square of the magnetic permeability. So you know it's that it's in the denominator there. That's the diamagnetic effect. Okay, all right, all right. Now so, you had more to say. Go ahead. So now you had more to add. Now we add the other stuff. Yeah. So it was a two part. So I'm really glad that you addressed that because that explains a ton. I was thinking split ring resonators because that's metamaterial and this um, negative acceptance can go really high. 
But if it, you actually want it to be negative susceptance really small like bismuth, that makes a lot more sense. Um, so the other part is since we're well, dealing- Well, he's correct. I hope he's correct. I'm, that, that, I'm basically, you know, I'm just saying what he told me. I don't have the proof of it. I, don't have, I, I didn't derive it myself. It may or may not be correct. I hope it's correct. Fingers crossed. So the second part, though, is since we're dealing with um, uh, particle antiparticle particle antiparticle pairs in solids, then we're dealing with the twisted Schwinger effect, which is a really re relatively recent thing that's only been out the last, I don't know, half a decade to a decade, where they, they're figuring out that you can actually, rather than just uh, splat the laser onto the material, you, you have a very high um, twist onto that laser. And that added angular momentum helps focus the laser down farther or something like that. Okay. You, oh, you're talking, are you talking about Ray Chow? Ray Chow's work on Twisted? Uh, uh, I don't think it was Ray Chow. I will email you uh, a couple yeah. of papers, but the one of the most recent papers is like a book of 138 pages. It's it's most comprehensive, and it was in April of this year. Oh, right, just tell me what is the actual physical situation? To, to so, so that just that. is un, unlike the regular Schwinger effect in vacuum, you're doing it in a solid. So now you already have changed, you know, your your medium, and then on top of that, because uh, now you've added a rotational angular element to the laser yes. beam. Right okay. now, now yes. you're you're getting even higher energy densities in that little tiny spot there. So the idea oh, wait, is, is he trying is he trying to do the Schwinger limit? Uh, it, yeah. So to... so so the theoretical limit from what I've been able to understand is that um, in I'm trying to remember, uh, magnesium oxide. I, f I forget what exactly the material was. Magnesium silicon. Anyways, in the material they were uh, they're calculating it now to where it's two times ten to the ninth volts per meter. And that they can achieve this with some out of second um, lasers. They got some some higher terahertz lasers out there now that are making yeah. this experimentally feasible. Terahertz, that's interesting. Yeah. So, all right. Oh, yeah. But okay, I'd have to see. I don't. You know, I don't. I don't quite see how. To, because of course, in the tic tacs and the machines, they don't have any. You know, obvious lasers or any high energy. It's all. Uh, it's all. No. It's the, all being, the MUFON, yeah. MUFON 74282, uh, most uh, famous uh, UFO sighting in MUFON history, was a hunter who uh, was this super dark project engineer who went hunting up in Canada, and he yeah. saw this barbell, it's called a barbell UFO, um, yeah. and on both ends he saw lights coming around, and he said that it kind of felt salty to his eyes, and he took his camera, and he got video of it, but the, the camera, it, it destroyed the video, and then he went and he analyzed the video with all of his equipment, and he was able to discern that there was information encoded in these multicolored laser beams coming off of this thing, and he since got, I mean, Well, like, yeah, that could be, but that patents. may not be the propulsion. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no doubt about that, but that doesn't mean it's being propelled by that. If no, no. Pepper, yeah. They, 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 they use lasers in most of their... Um, um, uh, scanning stuff. So there's videos out there where it's it's got a very slow twist uh, scanning laser beam that comes down over wherever they're yeah. scanning. Well, okay, let me let me tell you something about the weapon system. I sort of know about the weapons that these things have. They have uh, what Matt Matt Visser, who's a physicist in uh, New Zealand, he's, he's very good. He's published a paper. There are three kinds of gravity beam weapons. You can have what's called a pressor beam. You know, it's just like a pressure beam. You have a tractor beam. You know, where you see the with the, with the UFO lifts the pe the cars and the people, you know, like the rapture. And you have what's called a stressor beam, which is what's called a wild tense, it's a stretch squeeze thing. Now, I happen to know that there have been incidents with, uh, in which uh, a uh, saucer coming out of the water, a USO, a USO, actually shot a beam at a Navy ship and, uh, and the, it was a stressor beam where you just sort of like, uh, did you ever see like Yuri Geller where they, they twist the, the metal, you know, begins to twist, like stretch squeeze. It, it starts twisting, okay? And uh, they, did, they didn't sink, the, 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 the saucer didn't sink the ship. It just like, it was a, like a warning, literally a warning shot across the bow, don't fuck with us, okay? So there's that kind of weapon. Then there's also a defensive weapon, I call it the white hole, the white hole shield. This guy, Julian Gaffray, this French kid, has made a little video animation of it, where if you shoot a missile at this thing, they can activate the parade. The, the, it, it's like a white hole. You, you actually make what, what's called, it's like a white hole event horizon inside the material of the ship, which means it's like it, nothing can get through it. And not, and not even a nuclear blast will get through it. 
you can probably, it might even, well, it depends, but it might even protect against the nuclear bomb, okay? And, uh, and, and there, there have been, I've been told, you know, just this is anecdotal, it's, I can't, you know, I, I, I can't confirm uh, with 100% probability, but I've been told that there have been attempts to shoot down some of these machines and the missiles just bounce right out. They, they bounce right back. They, you know, they, there's evidence for the force shield. Now, of course, since these things are time travel machines, there are many different machines at different levels of technology. And some of them, are, we do shoot down. You know, they come from more primitive time travel, like the Roswell thing. You know, so, and sometimes, sometimes they crash. So just, to, just, just like we have an F, just like we have a, Wright Patterson, you know, the, the Wright brothers plane, we have the biplanes of World War One, World War Two, World War, you know, and now with the F 35s, there are different, there are different levels of uh, technology, even in these um, visitors, the, in these NHI machines, there are different kinds, you know, they're uh, coming from different time periods. Do you have so, any, um, do you have any additional okay. information on that ship that got a uh, stressor beamed? Uh, so we could look at more info on it somewhere no, else. It's, I shouldn't even said that because it's classified. I didn't hear nothing. I didn't hear nothing. I know you didn't. Yeah, but well, yeah, but everybody, the thing okay. is, I can't. I cannot tell you where. I cannot tell you when. I cannot tell you which navy it was. Well, you know, all that stuff. I, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't reveal that. But it, but you know, I have it from a very good source. I mean, I believe it with 90, 95, 98 percent, ninety nine percent probable confidence level because of the source is very reliable. Okay. Well, guys, on that note, Jack, let me thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir.